Welcome to the Clear to Send podcast, a podcast about wireless engineering, where we educate you on Wi-Fi technology, talk about design tips, troubleshooting, interviews, and the tools. Here are your hosts, Roel and Francois. This show is happily sponsored by Metageek. Wi-Fi is awesome when it works, but when it doesn't, the problem is usually a mystery. Unless you have Insider Office by Metageek. Insider Office quickly scans your wireless environment and recommends ideal channel selection to help you make your Wi-Fi awesome and keep it that way. Check out the solutions at medigeek.com to get started and get your Wi-Fi working the way you want it to. Hi guys, this is Francois from clear2send.net and here we go for another clear to send episode. I'm uh, here today with uh, my co-host Roel. Hi Roel, how are you? Hey everybody, how's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. So today we have a very special guest. Um, most of you already know him probably. His name is Devin Ekin. Hi, Devin. How are you? Hey, how's it going? Yeah, doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Uh, why don't you present yourself uh, to the listeners? You know, uh, what's your background? How did you start in Wi-Fi and what do you do now? Sure. Um, my background started with uh, electronics in the army, and uh, they kept uh, uh, demanding um, that I learn RF. I didn't even understand what RF was. <laughs> um, and you know, when when everybody else was, you know, I was 18 when I started, and you know, and when everybody else was drinking beer and having a great time uh, chasing, uh, you know, girls, I was studying RF, um, whether I wanted to or not, and. Um, and then, you know, from going from duty station to duty station then getting out of the military, everybody wanted RF, RF, RF all the time, calibration, repair of test instrumentation, and got a lot of background uh, in RF through that and eventually got very bored with that, got into networking, uh, did, you know, started in the Novell track in Microsoft, Cisco, and, and all down the line, of course, uh, kind of a typical path that a lot of um, IT folks take. And and then, you know, back in 1999, there was suddenly this thing called wireless LANs that was kind of a, a mix, you know, between, um, you know, networking, LAN networking and RF, which put me in kind of a, a unique unique position, I think. And and from there, um, I, uh, you know, I'd already been working in the consulting side of things with uh, a lot of certifications and so on and decided to, uh, you know, a lot of people needed education on this wireless LAN thing. And decided to um, found and, in fact, uh, co-founded with Kevin Sandlin a um, uh, a company called CWNP, Certified Wireless Network Professional. And it was a funny thing about that, you know, it was Kevin Devon, and our first three employees were named Scott. So it was uh, Kevin Devon, Scott, 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 and uh, <laughs> and so you know we we were just a small company like that for a long time, and and finally things started growing, the industry started started growing, and. And, uh, you know, I, ha- I wrote a, you know, a lot of books and, and courseware and exams on, uh, on Wi-Fi technology as it became, you know, called that uh, due to marketing. And, and then back in uh, uh, 09, the training market was pretty rough. We were a training and certification company and uh, they still, CWP still is and uh, doing quite well. And, and I, I left uh, my own company to go to Arrowhive Networks, was the chief Wi-Fi architect there for four years. Uh, left there, went to uh, Airtight Networks for a short stint, which is now Mojo Networks, and then uh, eventually uh, started my own company uh, doing consulting. The, the name of the company is Divergent Dynamics, and we do consulting for Wi-Fi only. That's that's really our, our uh, chief goal, consulting and teaching. So I teach a lot of classes for uh, you know folks like uh, Ekahow and CWMP and, and classes of my own on uh, Wi-Fi technology and soft skills and things like this. And so t- these days it's, you know, I work in K through 12, um, universities, hospitals, uh, doing design, validation, optimization, troubleshooting, you name it. So it's all Wi-Fi all the time. Awesome. Man. That's very a, good. That's a, yeah. that's a lot of uh, experience you got there under your belt. Yeah, it's just one of, to me, it's just one of those, uh, if you, if you never slow down, you get a lot of stuff done in a day, right? So you just, <laughs> just keep at it, keep at it. When everybody else uh, takes a break to watch the football game and eat hamburgers, I'm usually studying. <laughs> yeah. You're eating hamburgers yeah. and studying. <laughs> and studying. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, thank you for, you know, everything you've done, uh, creating the CWNP program. I think, uh, both Roel and I benefited from the program. 
uh, when we started and and starting to learn Wi-Fi. And I remember when I got introduced to the technology um, by my good friend Cedric, he gave me a CWNA book and he's like, go read this book. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing about CWNP. Um, you know, most people think it was, a, 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 uh, you know, two guys, Kevin and Devin, trying to make a, a buck. And if you've ever worked in the education market, you already know that there's no money in education. Uh, it <laughs> It was really a, a work of love. You know, we, we saw so many people out there that needed jobs and mm-hmm. Wi-Fi was a new technology. It was wireless LAN at that point. But, um, you know, the, it was a new market coming. We could see that it was going to be big and yeah. we wanted to help people get into new careers, new jobs, make it a good living instead of just an average living. And it was kind of to us was kind of a a way to give to people, a way to help people, kind of a, a ministry of sorts, you know, mm-hmm. just a, a way to give to people and help them. And, you know, it's been doing that now for a very long time. And and I have to say that even even me um, now as uh, you know, no longer an owner or anything like that, it still benefits me now. And uh, and so not only did, you know, do we design it and build it to be able to give to people and help people, it has turned around and given back to me so much. So. Uh, I'm as appreciative of it as anybody. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, hopefully we're contributing a little bit as well with the podcast. Great. <laughs> yeah, that's a goal. Um, all right. So today we're going to talk about the use of wider channels in, uh, you know, uh, enterprise Wi-Fi networks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you were talking about training. I recently attended the uh, Ekeha training that you uh, led in um, Washington. And... You know, I don't know. I, I came up with this subject uh, attending the, uh, the the training. Uh, we were talking a little bit about it, the impact it can have on a, you know, on a wireless network. And so I just thought, you know, it could be a good subject for uh, to have you on the show and talk, talk uh, about it. Um, you were bringing some really valid points during the training. So uh, maybe we can, you know, have a talk about it today and then share some stuff with the uh, listeners. Sure. And um, yeah. Uh, okay where would you like to start oh boy. um <laughs> yeah maybe we could start with the history a little bit you know uh, when wi-fi started how wide was the channels and what happened with the different uh, amendments sure. uh, maybe you can go through a little bit the history of uh, you know n ac and so on and explain you know what type of uh, uh, channels we can use in today's uh, you know a typical today's and wi- wi-fi enterprise network okay well, it all started, um, you know, back with just 802.11 Prime, and, and of course, then Prime uh, moved on to be 11B. Uh, the, you know, the frequency hopping, the infrared kind of went by the wayside, leaving only the direct sequencing. And 802.11 Prime direct sequencing and high rate direct sequencing, which is 11B, are both 22 megahertz wide channels, 22 megahertz. And then when we uh, you know introduced 11A, which was also at the about the same time, 1999, as uh, 11B, we uh, introduced 20 megahertz wide channels. But those, of course, uh, for 11A were in five gigahertz. Mm-hmm. And and then when 11G uh, came out, which was late 2003, early 2004, um, we simply adapted 11A over into 2.4 gigahertz and made it backwards compatible with B. And that was also using uh, 20 megahertz wide channels. But it had to be backwards compatible with devices that were also connected to those 11G access points of 22 megahertz wide channels. So G is kind of a hybrid, depending on the data rates that you're using, uh, a hybrid of um, you know 11B and 11A, if you will. It's a, it, those two technologies being mixed, so the channel widths are mixed. Then an 11N came along in 2009, and... 11N introduced a concept of channel bonding where we could take these OFDM channels from 11A and we could, you know, and of course 11G used them as well, um, used the 20 meg channels. But we could take these 20 meg channels and we could bond them such that we had one half was primary and one half was secondary. And the, uh, this gave us up to a maximum with 11N of 40 megahertz wide channels. So the the goal here of this bonding was speed. It give it gave us higher data rates. And when we don't have high density and we don't have all these other you know issues that we have today, then you know speed sounds like a pretty good idea to me. Um, but there's many things that come along that can kill these high data rates and make them very poor performing, which is probably some things we need to discuss today. The um, eleven the the important thing to to know about this channel bonding in eleven n is this primary and secondary half um, 
issue. Uh, the most important fact is that everything uses the primary all the time. There is no transmission uh, that doesn't use the primary. The secondary is only used when you're trying to send a data frame that is a wide channel data frame, meaning in what we call an MCS data frame. That is, it's not a legacy data rate of 1 through 54 megabits, but rather it uses MCS rates from the MCS table. You can mm -hmm. check those out at mcsindex.com. And so uh, the secondary is only in use for the data. And in a typical network, and this, of course, can vary greatly depending on the use cases, but in a typical uh, enterprise network, data is only about 25% uh, of the total. Yeah. So uh, when you've got a lot of management and control frames there, and depending on the data rates that the management control frames are being sent and how many you have and how things are configured and so on and so on, a lot of the the total you know spread of frame types it's going to to lean to the management and control so when you when you talk about these uh, these wide channel um, channel situations it's only those 25% roughly data frames that are using those wide channels that's the that's the only ones actually getting benefit from it mm. so all the management traffic is only using the primary channel right that's correct. Um, all the management control are just on the primary. And that's because there's probably clients that might not be compatible or capable of doing 40 megahertz channels or, or larger, right? Because yeah, it has well, to they, be backwards compatible. That's exactly the reason. Well, so so there's it's possible that we're wasting, right? We, we probably won't be using these bonded channels as much as we think we should if we're doing 802.11n. Do you think it's... Uh, uh, What's your point of view if we're going to 802 uh, AC, for example? Is well, the point you, you bring up uh, that uh, these wide channels, these bonded channels are inefficient. They are extremely inefficient. They're, they're great for marketing because they produce high data rates. But the ineffectiveness and inefficiency uh, of these channels in an enterprise, uh, these wide channels in an enterprise environment is unbelievable. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to see when you look at, um, you know, just a typical enterprise environment using 40 or 80 meg channels, you will see that the primary uh, oftentimes gets saturated. It's, it's up in the, you know, 75, 80 percent. Uh, range and then of course um, the secondary or secondaries, depending on if you're using 11N or 11AC, mm -hmm. are very lightly used. You know, maybe 25% or less used, and therefore you're not getting very much benefit out of the spectrum of those secondary channels, and that leads to high data rate, low capacity, and that that's a pretty significant issue. It leads to other problems as well that we're going to talk about. Um, but you can imagine that if 11N has this problem with only one bonded channel as a secondary, 11AC using 80 megahertz channels mm -hmm. can be that much worse because it has three secondaries. Yeah. Yeah. So I can, so, I can see this ahead. when people do their speed tests, right? They go to speedtest.net. It's going to yeah. take up that secondary because you're pushing a lot of data, right? Because they get the higher data rate and they see that. Yeah. But then when they're that's, just that's doing regular web traffic, they're not getting that higher data rate because it's it's a small payload often when they're just browsing the web and downloading smaller sets of data. Yeah, one uh, one common fallacy that you hear all the time is higher data rates give um, you know the wider channels give you the higher data rates, and higher data rates mean that you can get the data onto and off of the channel more quickly, therefore offering more capacity. This is a half truth. In, in fact, it does allow you to get the data onto and off the channel more quickly because you're sending at a higher data rate. However, there are many, many more factors at play. And uh, two, two, of these, yeah, two of these factors are the fact that the physical uh, header still goes at low data rates. The physical header is quite large, and it goes at 6 megabits, and it's going on the primary. And so that's, uh, that's one issue. The second issue that comes into play is the inefficiency of the second chan the secondary channels? We don't use them uh, hardly at all, um, but there there are many others. And and so when you when you look at the overall enterprise and you're wanting to increase capacity, increase overall speed and throughput per client, and that's really the way you should look at it is the throughput per client with the airtime that you have available. Uh, the way that you do that is with narrower channels. You want to have more efficiency, more you know, more use of the spectrum. 
you know, in in one class, um, you know, uh, it may have been your class, actually, uh, Francois, I can't remember, but uh, there was a problem where the hotel had a very small restroom. And the restroom had one, the men's restroom had one urinal, but when the class would go on break, there was just this one urinal and mm-hmm. everybody had to wait in line. And, and so during the class, you know, questions were asked about, you know, what about, what about the speed? You know, we get this extra data rate, you know, we go faster, we get the, the uh, data on and off the, the channel and that creates, you know, more, more available airtime, therefore more capacity. I said, uh, would it help? Um, it, within the, in the restroom, if, if one person could go in there and, and when they go, they go really fast. I said, <laughs> wouldn't the line, wouldn't the line still be stretched out the door for this one urinal? No matter how fast they go, there's always people waiting. And, and, uh, and the answer was, of course, obviously, yes. I said, but what if you had four urinals instead of, you know, one urinal and everybody could just go at kind of a normal pace? Wouldn't that clear the line more quickly? And the answer is obviously yes. So, it's not about putting everybody in. If you want capacity and speed per client, throughput per client, you you need more channels, more contention domains. Um, the the contention is is the capacity killer, and the the more you can lessen the contention, the better off you'll be. And that that's where this inefficiency of wide channels really it uh, really gets you. Um, is you're creating a with these wide channels a lot of contention. Yeah, so the, the frequency spectrum available would be like one of the requirements to, to have if we want to use wider channels. Yes, so right. um, the, the vendors, a lot of times, uh, they not only market the, you know, the higher data rate, get the, the data on and off faster and all of that stuff, which is a half truth, uh, but, but there's, there's more to it than that. They will alternate primaries as well. They'll say, well, since management control take up the bulk of the, um, the data, we'll just alternate the primaries and reuse the 80 over and over by default, by the way. And so they'll use, you know, um, you know, let's say channel 42, which is uh, 11 AC, 80 megahertz wide channel. And they'll set 36 as primary on one AP and 40, you know, 40 as primary on the next one and so on and so on. And when these APs get near each other, um, you know, in other words, if, if you're doing an automatic channel plan, they will, the channel plan will work itself so that they are, these channel plans are adjacent. So you have 36 plus, plus, plus next to, uh, you know, minus 40 plus, plus, and so on reusing the 80, um, uh, over and over, but alternating the primaries to get that, tr- that management control traffic off. Um, the problem that you run into is you get more and more 11 AC clients wanting to do more and more wide data. And there, <laughs> therefore, Everybody is still in a single file line for data frames. And so this produces a very low performance network, even though the, the data rate connectivity of most clients is very high. Yeah. So why do you think vendors ship out um, APs with default settings set at 80 megahertz? <laughs> <laughs> so there's it, it's one word, marketing, but there's yeah. many pieces of it. Um, you know, one is that most vendors have technical marketing engineers and the TME, TMEs. So the TME's job is to showcase the product in its best light, as well as to show how it's better than the competitors. And the the showcasing the product in its best light, you you know, uh, they will make the very bad assumption um, that it's it's in the customer's best interest. In fact, they may know better and still do it wrong, which is integrity issue, my, my humble opinion. But, but in any case, what they'll do is they'll pull it out of the box. They'll pull an AP out of the box. They'll pull a three by three client, like a MacBook Pro or something out of the box. And they will say, let's just connect it up and see how fast we go. And they're sitting you know, in the same room with the AP. They get a 1.3 gig connection on an 80 meg channel. And they say, look at that. And then they choose a channel that's not congested and they do a file copy and they get some six or 700 megabits of throughput because there's no contention. It's just the one client and the one AP and they're copying it to some really fast, you know, NAS or another laptop that has SSD and lots of RAM and so on. And they, they, they let the customer kind of extrapolate from that uh, demonstration that every, and it's not true, and maybe the, the, the vendor doesn't say anything past that. They just let the customer make a bad assumption that all of the clients all of the time will have six or yeah. 700 megabit <laughs> throughput. Okay. And if the customer knows nothing about 
half duplex, Wi-Fi contention, channel widths, their effects, and so on, they assume that in, a, in, a, in their classrooms where they have, let's say, 30 iPads or 30 Chromebooks uh, at a school, or maybe it's an office environment at a hospital or, or things like this, that all of those one-by-ones or two-by-twos, each one's going to get you know, six or 700 megs. Um, you know, they don't understand the one by one, two by two, three by three specs. They don't understand data rate versus throughput. So they just do this demonstration out of the box and let the customer mentally and wrongly extrapolate that demonstration into believing something that's not true. And so I've seen this firsthand many, many times, and uh, it's a uh, it's quite a problem. So marketing is the answer to your question. Hmm. Uh, I, I would like to see that change. So it's not gonna, it's not likely to change anytime soon. I know. Yeah, I, doubt I, I doubt that. I so. <laughs> so let's. I, I will say this: that through, uh, I mean, what's the word I'm looking for? Harassment. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> um, through through sheer harassing the vendors um, over this problem. Um, you know, you know, a lot of the vendors. I'm not going to you know pick on any one vendor, but a lot of the vendors realize that this this is a problem for real world deployments. So uh, there have been recently a couple of vendors who have switched their default channel widths from 80 to 20, and I applaud that greatly. I think that's a step toward integrity, a, a step toward good customer service, and it helps the customers, especially those who really don't know what they're doing, um, to have better deployments when they maybe they can't afford a, uh, a consultant, a systems integrator, or VAR to come in and help them. And, you know, they don't know where the resources are, you know, whether it be a study guide or a, a video to, to correct their you know, mistakes. Um, I, I applaud vendors that are taking that step. I believe it's a good one. Okay. But it's kind of like a thing where everyone will have to do it. I uh, hope sometimes. I hope they do uh, it, and I hope that okay. the commu the Wi-Fi community will uh, take those two or three vendors that have decided to make that change and shame everybody else into copying them and saying, "Look, if you're not doing it that way, you're doing something wrong here," and and kind of apply a little bit of social pressure to those vendors to make those changes because I believe it's in everybody's best interest to do so. Yeah, I, I agree with that because the there's been a couple of people online who will kind of shame other vendors into, you know, doing that default 80 megahertz channel yeah. with. And I think that's a good thing to do because like you said, it, it'd be a lot better for everybody, especially in the best interests of these vendors to make their products look like they work well. Right. And yeah, it's generally because people are deploying these, these APs and they're, they don't quite understand how Wi-Fi works and they don't understand the you know, client capabilities. And then they're, they, they get caught up in that marketing number, like you said, because they've tested this in a pristine environment and you know, you're getting that data rate, but that's not how all of our environments are. I mean, you, you've got that's offices right. that are in that have multi tenants. And uh, I mean, if you go to San Francisco, there's a lot of, offices that are using 40 80 megahertz channel widths which yeah. defeats the whole purpose because everyone's wi-fi is going to suck after that because they're all contending for the those same channels there's a there's a feature um uh in wi-fi called wide channel intolerant sometimes called 40 megahertz intolerant um this this is um it's an odd feature how it's implemented but one of the caveats is it's only applicable to 2.4 gigahertz and if we could make that work in 5 gig if we could get the IEEE and the Wi-Fi alliance on board uh, to, to do this for five gigahertz. Of course, the vendors are going to fight it, and the vendors are the makeup. They're the constituents of the Wi-Fi alliance, so I don't see it ever happening uh, because they want this marketing and the showing off the high data rates. But if we could get a feature in five gigahertz that was um, wide channel intolerant, and we turn that on, and our APs and clients then tell other APs and clients in the area, I'm not tolerant of a wide channel, and so therefore you must, just like it works with the uh, current um, standard, you must cut your channel width down. Um, mm. I think this, what this would do is it would absolutely wreck any 40 or 80 megahertz uh, wide, um, scenarios to the point where people would never design with them. And, and I'm okay with that. And, you know, the only time that, that I think channel bonding is actually appropriate, uh, is in homes and, and branch offices where you have clean spectrum and you have lots of spectrum and, I mean, heck, if you have 
Um, here at home, as an example, uh, my neighbors all use 2.4 gig because the, the local carrier, AT&T, puts their boxes. It's the only provider we can get. And they put their boxes, their Wi-Fi routers in every home. And so everybody's using 2.4. Nobody understands 5 gig because they're all doctors and lawyers and other types <laughs> of professionals. They're not technologists. And so I have a completely clean 5 gig spectrum. I mean, it's unbelievable. So do I use 80 meg channels in my house? You bet I do. I bump up the power a little bit to offset the noise floor problem, and and I'm off and running. And I think it's absolutely wonderful. I go, not only do I have high data rates, I have high throughput because I have almost no contention, almost no contention. I have, you know, a limited set of devices in my home and, and you know, what, maybe a couple of us or three or four of us are using the uh, Wi-Fi at the time, maybe not on the same access point. And so it's um, it's a wonderful thing. I use 80 meg channels. But in branch offices and home offices and clean spectrum areas, this is great. But when it comes to enterprises, um, you know, Keith Parsons has a, a kind of a simple saying that I, I like. He says, use as wide of a channel as you can without creating interference. In other words, co-channel interference or contention is another word for that. So um, I think that that's a good approach. And in most cases, and in the 95 percentile use cases, you'll see that 20 meg channels usually ends up being the answer. Mm -hmm. So how do you measure, uh, you know, how the channel is busy? Let's say you so, have a network with 40 megahertz wide channels and you want to see, okay, is, this, is it still a good idea or am I having too much contention that should go down to 20 megahertz? How would you measure that? Yeah, so um, if you, uh, first, I think it's, you start by not troubleshooting, you start by designing. And of course, you know, if you're troubleshooting, then then uh, your question is directly applicable. If you're designing, you, de you try to design out as much contention as you can, right, to start with. But when you're looking at, you know, let's say you're diagnosing, you're troubleshooting uh, a channel, and you want to understand channel uh, utilization, there's a couple of different ways to go. Um, channel utilization really is, um, it's just like noise. You, you have to see it from the perspective of the device that understands the spectrum in the way that it understands. So for example, let's suppose I took a spectrum analyzer and looked at the channel utilization. The spectrum analyzer is not decoding 802.11. It's looking at the raw energy. And, it, and in, let's say you were looking at, um, I don't know, channel 6 in 2.4 gigahertz. A spectrum analyzer is going to see any, any Wi-Fi systems that, that are uh, either on channel 6 or overlapping with channel 6. It will also see Bluetooth. It will also see um, any other interferers, microwave ovens, uh, video cameras, you name it. There's an you know, endless number of interferers out there, and they're going to see all of that as utilization of the airtime, right? The, the channel's utilization. But they don't discriminate between different types of uh, use, different protocols, if you will. So if you're using a spec and in order to assess the channel utilization, that is kind of a high level, what all's there is, you know, what impact is the not Wi-Fi maybe having, um, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's a little bit of guesswork, if you ask me. Then another alternative and a pretty good alternative is to understand what the infrastructure is saying. Um, access points as of, I believe it was 802.11e, had something called the uh, channel load information element um, that is broadcast in beacons, or at least it can be broadcast in beacons. Mm -hmm. It's not always. Um, some vendors do it by default, some don't. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this is usually a possibility. If the APs are then announcing the channel load, this is the channel utilization or the airtime utilization or, um, you know, that, uh, that it experiences at that AP. Then you can take a, uh, you can either look in your infrastructure management tool and pull that number, um, or you can uh, take a scanner like, um, uh, Wi-Fi Explorer, thank you, thank you for your contribution, Adrian, um, Wi-Fi Explorer and, uh, um, and that will pull that channel information, that channel load information element, uh, and decode that, and then put it in the the regular chart there, Wi-Fi Explorer. So um, that that's it looks at what the AP is saying. So that's mm -hmm. another good alternative, and that takes into consideration what the Wi-Fi radios experience for channel utilization, which is very important. It's more ac accurate and more applicable to what we do as Wi-Fi engineers than a spectrum analyzer would be. Uh, but there's the caveat that it only is from the perspective of the AP, not from the perspective of the client. Mm -hmm. So 
so there's always some little caveat that says yeah. this is not a perfect scenario. Yeah. So using Wi-Fi Explorer, it'll grab the um, the channel load uh, information element. But yes. you're saying be- even though you're running that on a client device like a laptop, that information element's coming from the AP. So that's still the AP's perspective. That's correct. And, okay. and that's its shortcoming. If we could get both the AP and the client's perspective, I think that would be uh, a lot more um, uh, holistic uh, from you know viewpoint for troubleshooting. But like I say, there's always some shortcoming in every methodology. So you, uh, most Wi-Fi engineers tend to use both methodologies. They will mm-hmm. look at the spectrum analyzer, which gives you a kind of a holistic, high-level view of the RF from the client's perspective, Mm -hmm. but then uh, go and look at the AP's perspective for Wi-Fi. It's kind of, I need a little bit of both. Now, there are additional um, tools out there now, Um, like, for example, Nuts About Nets has a a new tool um, that uh, can look at the channel utilization from the client's perspective. Um, That's a pretty unique uh, item, cost about 250 bucks, I think it is. Um, And uh, I think Keith Parsons just wrote a, uh, a blog about it just the other day. Mm, okay. So, um, so you can go to WLAMPros um, dot com and check check out that uh, uh, that write up. Yeah, you're gonna have to check that out. Well, what are your thoughts on also putting an AP on the table next to a client and getting channel load information from that AP? Um, you know, it's it, it's a uh, it's not a bad idea. Um, I would say if you were going to do that, probably. Um, the sensitivity of APs usually pretty far exceeds that of a client. Not always, of course, but usually mm-hmm. because clients vary so much from one by one all the way to three by three. Most of your APs now are three by three or four by four. Not all, of course, but but a lot of them. So if I were going to take that perspective, I would find an AP that is uh, that does the channel load information element, that it has the ability to put that out. And I would want the the lowest end AP that I could get. Okay. Uh, th- that might be a two by two eleven n, which is still being sold in by many vendors. Uh, it might be, you know, something a little bit older, uh, like an eleven a g access point that has, uh, you know, kind of, you know, internal antennas, but has good code. In other words, the code supports the channel load information element. The reason that I say that that's that would be a good idea is because the sensitivity of an older AP, much older AP, would more closely mimic the uh, the sensitivity of your your kind of mediocre clients your mm-hmm. low end clients are always going to be far less sensitive and the sensitivity comes into play because the better you can hear the better you can hear interference right yeah so, uh, so you want the hearing of the AP the sensitivity to closely match that of of the bulk of the client population if you were going to take that approach Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's important to to realize. You don't want to use the latest and greatest AP, which has you know the best received sensitivity to hear things right, from it can far hear away. So much, <laughs> yeah, it, it would say that uh, the channel utilization is very high when the client would experience it is very low because the client is near death. You know, the mm-hmm. client can't hear, but in a small radius, it's it's very low sensitivity, and therefore it can't hear many of the interference sources. Imagine yourself with, um, you know, just wherever you are and you put in a hearing aid with normal hearing, you put in a hearing aid and turn the volume all the way up. Suddenly everything, everything seems super loud. Even the background noise seems super loud simply because your hearing is so good. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly the channel utilization, um, goes up. In other words, the, the energy that you can either detect from other Wi-Fi transmitters um, or the energy that you can't detect that trips a threshold, you know, a energy detect threshold, either way um, is going to add to that channel utilization. Hmm. Awesome. That's a pretty good perspective of, of things. All right. Let's talk about some of the impact uh, that we can have on the Wi-Fi network if we decide to use wider channels. Um, you, Devin, do you want to talk about SNR a little bit and how it's important to consider it? Uh, yes. So uh, when you widen the channel uh, by double, so if you're going from 20 to 40 or 40 to 80, uh, then every time you double that channel, the noise floor comes up by 3 dB. In other words, it doubles. That that phenomenon is is where um, is you know the way you look at that is you say uh, you know every megahertz of spectrum has a fixed amount of noise in it. So if you double the amount of spectrum, uh, let's say from a megahertz to two megahertz, you have double the noise. Well, double is three dB. 
So if you were doubling from 20 to 40, you're doubling whatever's there. Now, it may not make uh, great sense from a visual perspective if you were looking at it on a spectrum analyzer to say there is twice as much noise because I don't see it come up. But that's how it's perceived by the by the receivers and um, that that uh, double the spectrum is double the amount of noise. Therefore, if you went from 20 to 40, the offset you're, you're going to bring the SNR down because the noise goes up. The SNR goes down uh, because the SNR is a differential between the noise and the signal level, the RSSI. And so you need to bump up as an offset, bump up the RSSI by 3 dB. So turn up your transmit power by 3 dB. And that's going to give you the equivalent uh, SNR as you would have had, you know, at 20. Now, if you go up to 80, likewise, you need to bump it up another 3 dB. But this has pretty significant ramifications. So if I um, am using 20 megahertz channels, I'm already in a situation where I have the best channel reuse and therefore the best chance of having the least amount of co-channel interference or contention, if you will. I like to use the word contention instead of CCI. Uh, it's a little more accurate, I think. So you have the least possibility for contention, which is great. When you cut your channel numbers in half. In other words, you double your channel width, you have half as many channels to work with. In some cases, it's less than half because you're bonding with, let's say, um, 140 with 144, and a lot of your clients not being 11AC, they may not be able to use 144 and so on. So it's either half or less than half. That means that same channel APs will be much closer. And in that being the case, you have, especially in a 3D environment, like a multi-tenant building or, or a just a multi-floor building in general, um, you're, you're going to have a far greater chance of having contention. And so if you then turn up the power 3 dB, then it, of course, then according to the, uh, another thing from Keith Parsons I really like is his analogy. He calls it the want, don't want, don't care um, coverage pattern. So uh, the desirable signal level coming from the AP is the want. Then past that, the don't want is just interference. It's not very usable, uh, or at least suboptimal. And then after that, you don't care. After it reaches uh, about 40 BSNR, you don't care anymore. So the don't want is quite large. It's very large, many times bigger than, than the want, the usable signal range. So if I were to reword that, I would say the interference range is much larger than the usable signal range uh, of an access point. So when you start turning up the power, even 3 dB, that's double the power, the, the interference range is much, much further. Therefore, you have – this is kind of a double whammy. First, you cut your channels in half, uh, the number that you have to work with, therefore, in, in, with the possibility of increasing co-channel interference or contention, and then you turn the power up to offset the SNR to keep the data rates good, and therefore, you hurt yourself again. When you move up to 80, you've upped your power now uh, 6 dB, which is really gives you a nice long-range interference, mm -hmm. uh, and you've mm -hmm. cut your channels in half again. So there's with 80 meg channels, there is almost... In an enterprise environment of any kind, there's almost no chance of not having a bunch of interference. So it's just kind of silly. People use them as defaults, and it's just a, it's a given that you're going to have a lot of contention, therefore poor performance. Hey, everyone. Let's take a break to think about Wi-Fi for a moment. It's awesome when it works, right? But when it doesn't, the problem is usually a mystery. If you're sick of simply rebooting your devices and crossing your fingers every time your Wi-Fi goes down... Let the Wi-Fi experts at MediGeek make the invisible visible. Their powerful diagnostic solutions visualize interference from external Wi-Fi and non-Wi-Fi sources and will help you configure your wireless network for maximum coverage and throughput. From a weekend enthusiast to an enterprise IT professional, MediGeek has everything you need to make Wi-Fi awesome and keep it that way. Check out their solutions at MediGeek.com to take your first step towards awesome Wi-Fi because I use Channelizer to actually visualize the spectrum whenever I'm troubleshooting an issue that seems to be coming from maybe a non-Wi-Fi source, for example. And I've also used the Insider Office as a network scanner to figure out what wireless networks are in the area, what channels they're using, and which channels I should use. And just a little tip, you could also plug in your Wi-Spy DBX and use that with Insider Office to get some channelizer light, for example. You can see some spectrum analysis 
with Insider Office. Well, anyhow, if you guys are interested, take a look at Medigeek.com to see what you can do for your Wi-Fi network. All right. Then another problem that's introduced with the use of wider channels is um, I know you, you touched you touched the subject a little bit at the beginning of the uh, podcast, but it's called OBSS. Do you want to? It's it's a different type of interference. Do you want to explain this uh, this problem? Sure. Um, three different types of interference that we we run into. First is co-channel interference or contentious strand, standard contention. And, and of course, the 811 protocol was designed uh, to cope with this, to deal with this, and, and does quite well. Uh, certainly, we lose capacity, uh, and the user experience could be affected if we don't have enough capacity per client, uh, depending on the applications in use. But in general, the, the greatest impact of, of CCI is simply loss of capacity. Then there's the second one is ACI, adjacent channel interference, and that's where you have uh, channels that are, uh, are two APs on different channels, but those channels overlap each other to some degree. And there's, you know, different, there's like six different causes, or we call the six tenets of ACI, um, that can, you know, work their way in to cause these, this overlapping of channels but ACI has two problems. First, it's a loss of uh, capacity. And secondly, it's, it's a, a very detrimental impact to uh, the user experience. And so CCI is not good, but it's, it's, um, but it's not terrible. Uh, ACI is, is pretty bad. It's, it really impacts the user experience in a big way. And then what's even worse is overlapping basic service set, the OBSS. Now, to be more accurate, I like to call this the primary secondary OBSS because a lot of folks will say, well, overlapping basic service set, isn't that just CCI? And you could take it that way, you certainly could. So it can be the term itself is a little uh, hokey, um, but that is the term that that's kind of an industry standard term at this point. So it's no running away from it. But I like to say primary secondary OBSS, which means that one AP that is physically adjacent to another AP whereby they're both using bonded channels, in other words, 40 or 80s. And um, if one of them's secondary is overlapping the other's primary, you have an OBSS condition. So let's, let's put that into real numbers. Suppose that I have two APs that are adjacent, physically adjacent, maybe not in the same room, but they can, they can hear each other. And one is on 36 plus, they're 11 in, one's on 36 plus, the other is on 40 minus. So mm -hmm. at this point, the 36 plus has a secondary channel of channel 40 and channel 40 minus its primary is on 40. So the a, the 36 plus APs secondary will step on the primary of the other AP and vice versa, by the way, because the 40 minus has a secondary of 36 and 36 is the primary of the other AP. So these secondaries are sitting on the of the they're sitting on the adjacent APs primary. This is a big problem because. It's not just like ACI uh, because that, that would be bad enough. ACI can happen on, the, on your primaries, but at least with ACI, you have th uh, the primaries operating by the same rules for channel access. With OBSS, you do not. The secondary channels have different rules for accessing the channel than, than do the primaries. <clears throat> I'm making myself a note here. It's one thing I want to say. I don't want to forget it. Um, <laughs> So I have to make myself a note. So the uh, the secondary uh, rules are, uh, well, let's start with the primary rules. They're pretty simple. Primary access rule, primary channel access rules is, um, uh, for clear channel assessment says, first, you do a, uh, a carrier sense. The carrier sense is down to roughly or statistically about uh, 4 dB SNR. So, so can the AP decode any Wi-Fi transmission from any transmitter, client or AP, on its channel, and that, that can take place down to about four and sometimes even three dB SNR. About 85% of the time at four dB SNR, it can be decoded, the, uh, the uh, uh, physical layer header. So if it can, it will cause the clear channel assessment uh, to go busy. If, if it comes back idle on the, on the uh, carrier sense, it will move on to energy detect. On the energy detect, the threshold on a primary channel is negative 82 dBm, which is not so bad. That's a pretty decent threshold, I guess, for, um, you know, for a energy detect. Now, the problem for OBSS comes in uh, on the secondary channel. 
The secondary channel on 11N, and that is, you think, well, we're moving on to 11AC these days, so that doesn't apply, but it does because we have lots of 11N clients operating out there, and anytime 11N clients are operating, the client and the AP have to operate by 11N rules for that particular client. Mm. So we have lots of operation by 11N rules. So under 11N rules, the secondary channel must, um, first, it does not do a carrier sense at all. It never even tries to decode anything on the channel. It just says, ah, don't need to decode. I will just measure the energy. And you think, well, maybe that would be okay, um, provided the threshold was really, really sensitive. In other words, it was in the maybe the, the mid to high neg 80s, but it's not. It's neg 62. So if I transmit or I, I, trans, um, I kind, of, kind of convert that into human language, it would sound like this. <clears throat> On the secondary, I don't care if anybody's talking. And unless somebody's shouting gibberish in my ear uh, with a megaphone, then I'm going to just automatically consider the secondary channel clear. That's about the way that they perceive it. So mm -hmm. next 62 is so loud that it takes a huge amount of power to trip that threshold to make it go busy. So it almost always goes idle. So if the if you were to be able to clear the primary, the secondary almost always clears, and therefore you transmit. And when you transmit, you step on your neighbor. Your secondary... Collisions. We'll step yeah. on your on the primary. And what happens on the primary on the neighbor? Every single transmission uses the primary. So you have collisions on the neighbor's primary every time the secondary is used. Mm -hmm. This is a significantly bad issue. And in fact, um, my friend Rick Murphy ran some some tests just to get the data. We wanted to see what the data looked like on this. And he did a very interesting test, I thought. <clears throat> the He had two APs in a room. Uh, they were both connected to a file server. One of them was 11A. It was only capable of 11A, and he ran 11A on channel 36. He had an 11N um, that was configured for 40 minus. The first test was simple throughput test, downlink, real simple, and uh, on a 54 megabit data rate, which of course he's going to get that because he's in the you know neg 50s uh, DBM power, you know RSSI. He got 22 and a half megabits per second, and it was perfectly steady as you would expect it to be. No contention, no interruptions, no interferers, no nothing. And, and the data rate stayed at 54, the throughput at 22 and a half, life was good. At the same time then, he switched on a file copy on a 40 minus, and the secondary of the 40 minus was hitting the primary so hard that the data rate couldn't even be maintained. And in fact, it dropped from 54 all the way to 36. There were so many errors, it kept dropping its data rate. The throughput then went from 22 and a half um, down to eight megabits per second of throughput. And the, uh, the throughput chart was so erratic, it was up, down, up, down, all over the place. And therefore, the user experience was greatly impacted. So this OBSS condition problem is a very major problem it's far, far worse than CCI, and it's significantly worse than ACI, and it's all because the channel access rules of the secondary channels are different than the primaries. Now, it sounds what, like, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was going to say it sounds like it's going against the principle of collision avoidance, you know, yeah. introduced by the Wi-Fi te technology. It is, and what what makes matters worse is that on 11AC, even though they did add what I like to call the Band-Aid, but this Band-Aid is on an open heart wound, you know, blood squirting everywhere, and they <laughs> put a Band-Aid on it. Um, and that's really what happened. What they did was the secondary channel now has a NEG72 carrier sense uh, function added. But NEG72 is it's pretty, um, uh, you know, I, I would say that, that that threshold needs to be much more sensitive. That's a pretty high number. So if that threshold were down in the, the you know, low to mid 80s, maybe even better, that would be fine. It would be as good as a, you know, at least as uh, good as a primary, which, but um, that, but they didn't. They gave us a kind of, you know, odd band aid. Now, for what reason? I don't know. I know the what, not the the why on that one, but mm -hmm. I can tell you that Band-Aid doesn't work very well because when you when you have OBSS conditions, like most vendors out of the box do, they will have 36 plus 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 right beside it. They'll have four, you know, minus 40 plus plus. In other words, they're all using channel 42, but they're alternating primaries, and this becomes a significant issue. 
the more 11AC clients you have, the more data you have, um, the more you're using the secondaries and the more OBSS problems you have. So that's a, I mean, that's a pretty significant problem and everybody's doing this out of the box. Hmm. So yeah. if you want to, like one solution would be to only use like, let's say uh, channel 36 for the primary um, and then channel 40 as a secondary, right? In this case, you will just, you'll go back to a CCI issue, right? Yeah, so if that's right. So if I uh, was, if I had my heart set on using wide channels, let's say it was 40s, I was being at least conservative about it. Um, then the simple way to fix the OBSS problem is to only allow high side secondaries or low side secondaries, but never mix them. That's yeah, the answer. Okay. So the, these channels are bonded in discrete pairs. You can't, uh, you know, it's 36 and 40 are always a bonded pair. Wh which one's primary is your choice in most cases, uh, in most vendors' equipment. But what you can't do is bond, for example, 40 and 44. Um, 44 is paired inextricably with 48. So they're, they're in discrete bonded pairs. And so if you always make them pluses for secondaries or always make them minuses for secondaries, you solve this problem for bonded channels. Mm. Okay, so we've talked about, you know, type of problems in, introduced when uh, using wider channels. Uh, Devin, do you have any examples of, you know, you came into uh, to work on a Wi-Fi network and they were using 40 megahertz wide channel or even 80 megahertz wide channels. And then just the fact of uh, uh, switching it to using 20 megahertz wide channels, you saw improvement in, in performance and, yes. and capacity. Do you have some examples to share? Oh uh, sure. Um, there was a, there was a university once um, that I went to, and they had they were you know they were using a single channel architecture, which by itself is not a problem. I mean it's a scale issue, of course, but you know it has its advantages too. But it's definitely a scale issue. But the the premise that it was sold under um, was that that you use wider channels. And therefore, the transmissions can go faster, therefore get the transmissions onto and off of the channel more quickly, therefore more capacity, which again is a half truth. And so I was called to the university for troubleshooting and redesign. They wanted me to try to figure out what was going on and then redesign the network afterwards. But they, it was so broken at that point that they, they just couldn't do anything. And when I get there, I mean, it only took a few minutes to figure out what was going on and tell them what to do to fix it. But uh you know, but they hired me for a week and, you know, it was kind of hard to say, Hey guys, it's only been 15 minutes and I know you hired me for a week, but I'm going home now. That's not, <laughs> really, that's not okay. So I said, um, it's either we drink coffee for, you know, four days, seven hours and 45 minutes, or we go and fix some stuff. And so we, we went to the worst of it, you know, student centers and libraries and things like this, uh, where they had, um, you know, the, just a huge population of students, you know, you're talking, you know, a couple of thousand students just running around everywhere on one floor of a building, you know, there's because there was, you know, lounge areas and there was uh, food court areas and there were banking areas and there were library areas all on one floor in some of these student centers. And so, um, you know, the channel utilization was, it was completely pegged on the 80 meg channels they were using. It was completely and utterly pegged. And, and so I said, you know, the, the simple answer here is to simply use 20 megahertz wide channels. And of course, the vendor balked immediately. No, no, no. You know, on and off the channel faster, more capacity. I said, it don't work like that, fellas. And and so, um, so the, of course, since they had hired me to do the work, I got, you know, I got to make the call and I said, let's switch it all to 20s. Let's turn off some of these uh, access points. Now, I didn't switch vendors. I simply used the same vendor and, um, and switched it over to uh, a multi-channel architecture using 20s, and it was extraordinary, the difference. They had plenty of internet pipe. You know, they, they didn't skimp on anything. They, the university had plenty of money, and so uh, everything was great, but they had just bit into this marketing line. And mm -hmm. so when we switched it over to 20s, it we, we in this one floor, I remember specifically, we had 28 access points. We turned off 19 of them, um, leaving nine, and we and on, on 5 gigahertz, we, we used, um, you know, just uh, Uni 1 and Uni 3, so I let, you know, nine channels, and to prove the point, and the channel utilization on each of those 20s went down to under 10%, where the 80s were completely and utterly pegged. It was just, a, you know, it was like 90% utilization. Suddenly, the students started talking. You could hear, man, the Wi-Fi is awesome, and it was just <laughs> it was a simple change, right? We just said, hey, let's just use all these channels one time on this floor to give a, get an idea of how, how much this is going to improve. We did that, and the students were all happy, and they were like, that's it. Switch everything, and I'm like, yes, let's switch everything. So 
I run into this at, at hospitals. I run into universities, K through 12s, simply because of two things. One, the manufacturer demos the product this way. So that's the way it gets deployed. And secondly, um, uh, oftentimes it gets deployed because that's the default settings. They just turn it on. It works out of the box. So says the manufacturer, no tuning, no configuration, no best practices, no nothing. Minimum data rates, uh, you know, a ton of SSIDs, the whole, the whole lot. Right. And channel widths are one of the big ones of, you know, if I if were making a top 10 list, channel widths would make, you know, probably in the, in the top two or three items, probably the top two items that I would be addressing. Yeah. So what you did there is that, that floor specifically, they were there wasn't enough contention domains. So then, right. by splitting them in the twenty, their users were able to you were able to split them off into smaller contention domains. So that way, they weren't contending on the same channel. That's right. What you did, you know, in that in that case, was you created lots of contention domains. If you equate this to an Ethernet hub, uh, would you rather have two twelve port hubs uh, connected to a switch, or would you rather have one twenty four port hub? Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, you know, that's it's a you know anybody who's working Ethernet knows that a bigger hub is a worse hub. Yeah. Right. You want the you want smaller contention domains. You want less contenders in the contention domain. Mm -hmm. It's for that reason that a single client is actually the most throughput an AP will ever be able to achieve. (laughs) And so, you know, people say, no, Mm -hmm. the more clients we add, the more throughput we're going to get. It's actually the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. More more contention, less overall throughput. Yeah. Everyone gets a piece of that, that pie. So if you've got one pie, everyone getting to that pie, everyone gets a small slice. That's right. So one one thing I did want to um, uh, bring in, we talked about a little while ago about how um, the uh, the smaller channels are more efficient use of the spectrum. Um, there's there's more pieces than just that. The creating of smaller contention domains. There's all these hidden uh, things as well. For example, uh, you know we talked about the OBSS condition and how the the channel um, you know the the secondary is not being used that much really, so it's inefficient. Well. There's also the, the access method methodology is different as well. Not just the uh, the rules of access, but also the timing of the access. Primary channels are checked for clear channel assessment every nine microseconds. The secondaries are only checked every twenty five. So it, in other words, it takes them twenty five to clear. So if they're taking twenty five to clear, that means the primary clear he may clear the channel in nine microseconds. Actually, it only takes four microseconds to run a full CCA, but it, it's given nine. So uh, he may clear it and say it's clear, and then the secondary is like, "I'll be with you in a second. I'll be with you in a second. I'll be with you in a second. And and finally, the secondary clears. By the time that the secondary clears, the primary has been doing clear channel assessment all along, and it may suddenly busy up, mm-hmm. and so. This uh, this 25 uh, microsecond clearing time or uh, channel assessment time um, is um, a pretty inefficient use as well. It slows the primary down. So um, you also have problems where the primary, since it's used for all transmissions, um, it, it can be choked out. This happens a lot when you're doing uh, 80s. The primary gets so saturated um, – uh, and this happens in single channel and other other scenarios as well. It gets so saturated, you have no access to the secondaries whatsoever. For example, let's say that my secondary or secondaries cleared, but the primary can't clear. <laughs> you know, the secondaries are clear because nobody's doing anything uh, on those secondaries. But the primary is being used by management control and data from a humongous number of clients. It will just always be busy, and therefore, if the primary is busy, you can't use the set. You can't clear the secondaries. They, I mean, they, it's you can't use them. Mm-hmm. And so, the the clients that want to do wide data frames have to get in line, uh, like everybody else. So, in a nutshell, if I were to summarize that. I would say that uh, overuse of the primary can uh, hinder use of the secondaries at all. Mm -hmm. A lot of dynamics happening here. Yeah, I thought Wi-Fi was easy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's a there's a lot to consider when you're using wider channels, man. I'm getting a lot out of out of this. Yes, channel widths are a uh, they're marketeers' um, a best friend, and they're an engineer's worst. Uh, worst enemy. So now it makes me wonder: What about using smaller, um, you know, channels? Maybe ten megahertz wide channels or five megahertz wide channels. Is that something that was considered um, 
by the IEEE or even tested. I know it's it's used in other, uh, you know, uh, 802.11 standards. Um, yes. So 11AX forthcoming, uh, you'll see um, that uh, the products are going to hit somewhere around Q1 of 2018. So the vendors like to say anyway, uh, they're always late. But um, the, 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 the purpose, uh, the, even the name of 11AX is high efficiency. Uh, 11N was called high throughput. 11AC was called very high throughput. And, and uh, 11AX is high efficiency. I like to say that the IEEE is like Forrest Gump. Um, <laughs> you know, if you've ever seen Forrest run, um, so it, in you know in the movie uh, he played football for Alabama and and he caught the ball and he would run all the way out of the stadium. And so pretty soon they came up with a methodology to cause him to stop. Everybody hold up a sign, say stop. And and so that's what happens with the IEEE. If you say, hey guys, we need a bit more speed. Then, then they create, you know, 40 and 80 and 160 megahertz wide channels that we can't use. You know, we never use 160s. We only use 80s in homes and branch offices if you're designing properly and, and, and you have to have clean spectrum there. Um, we use 40s only when we can get away with it without co-channel interference. And then most of the time we use 20. So they create this monster um, and and make the standard, you know, that much more complicated and introduce all kinds of problems in order to give us speed. And they just go off the deep end. Well, then we say, hey, guys, we can't use 160 meg channels. We can barely use 80s hardly mm -hmm. ever. So what can you do for us? And they go, I know. Let's create high efficiency. The the, and so they turn around and run the same way. They run completely off a cliff, go in the opposite direction until we have to hold up a sign and say, stop. You know, the complexity of 11AX is overwhelming. You've got OBSS coloring and OFDMA and, and down to two megahertz wide channels. Um, you know, and you can imagine how many two megahertz wide channels fits into an 80 megahertz wide yeah. channel. <laughs> So these are these are sub carriers that are operating, you know, almost like sub channels operating there. And so the complexity and then, of course, you got backwards compatibility. And and then you have to say, well, if I've got let's say, for example, I've got uh, 11AX in my clients. Most most of my clients are capable of 11AX. Uh, it'll take some time, as we know. Mm -hmm. But let's say that they are and they're using, you know, very efficient two megahertz wide channels. And there's a, you know, the AP is talking to, let's, let's just say nine clients at a time and uh, downlink for sure, but maybe on the uplink, we don't really know if uplinks can work out very well. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, but let's say it's being very efficient and that's its job. That's the whole goal of the, of this amendment. Well, in comes 11 AC client on the same 20 megahertz wide channel, the 11 AC client will use the entire 20 megahertz, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. If you were using a 40 megahertz channel, you might have 18 clients uh, or, or even more talking at the same time. And this one 11AC client or 11N client comes in and uses up the whole 40 meg spectrum. So the point I'm making is, what about backwards compatibility? We These vendors will make the 11AX stuff. They will sell it into the market and they will say it's much more efficient. It gives you more overall capacity, blah, blah, blah. And yet most of your, it, even if you have some 11N and 11AC clients, every time they talk, a whole bunch of 11AX clients can't get anything or can't send anything. So mixing 11AX with 11N and AC is not a great idea. It's mm -hmm. actually a very bad idea because you won't get, especially we know how long it's going to take for the 11 AX clients to make their way into the market where they become the bulk of the market, right? That's going to yeah. take four or five years. Yeah. So, well, four or five years is the lifetime of the, the first generation of the 11 AX uh, infrastructure hardware. So, so we're saying now that you won't actually get any of that efficiency <laughs> that, uh, for the whole lifetime, the first generation of the APs. Now there has to be some way to fix that. Well, it just so happens that it is, but it's very complex. The The answer is dual 5 gigahertz, whereby we have 11 AX on one radio and we have 11 AC slash N on the other radio. Okay. 
So now we need to use, let's say, 11V. Um, we could use for steering, you know, channel steering. And we could have the AP look at the client capabilities in the association request frame and say, hey, you, you should not be coming in on this channel. You should be going over here to my partner uh, because he's, a, you know, you're 11AC, he's 11AC. You can go fast. You won't disrupt my efficiency. Now you'll have one radio that's efficient, one radio that's fast. And you want to keep the fast guys on the fast radio and the efficient guys on the efficient radio so that you get the best of both worlds. As soon as you mix them, the efficient is no longer efficient. Mm-hmm. And you know, the fast can be fast as long as it has the channel, but efficient can't be efficient if, if you got one guy you know, talking and messing up the, everything for all of those other clients. But then that brings yet another problem, and that is how do you design for dual 5 gigahertz? That's hard enough. But then on top of that, you still may have to bring in 2.4 gigahertz. You have to watch your channel spacing on the same access point. You're also bringing in DFS, non-DFS problems at the same time. So in other words, I want to uh, make sure that my non-DFS capable clients always have a non-DFS channel uh, to work with. So I always want to pair up DFS, non-DFS across the dual 5 gig at the same time as I'm doing this 11AC slash N uh, paired up with 11AX. So design is about to to get a tenfold kick in the pants. <laughs> Just throw in the towel. <laughs> that's right. It, it's going to become quite complex to be able to optimize your network. Yeah. You're working with many sets of variables. You know, it, it, if you think about 11AX, it is efficient. That's great. But you, and then you pair that up with dual five gig, which means you can you can actually get some efficiency out of it. But then a, <laughs> this is the real kicker, and comes back to the original discussion of channel width. A dual five gig operating with two twenties is still stealing 40 megahertz of spectrum at a time. So your channel reuse um, problem in a multi uh, story building is just as complex, maybe even more complex now, uh, because of DFS, non DFS, 11 AX, non 11 AX, or pre 11 AX. And then on top of that, you're burning 20 meg at a uh, per radio, mm-hmm. but they're not contiguous. Yeah, because they have to have the spacing right between yes. the frequencies. That's right. You got to have it. Cisco's uh, recommends 100 on theirs. Arrowhive recommends 80 on theirs. Uh, vendors will recommend different spacings based on the amount of, of ACI their testing shows and what's acceptable to them in their in their tuning of their drivers and schedulers and so on. But um, ultimately, you're still burning up 40 total megahertz of spectrum, even though it's a discontiguous pair of 20s. So your channel planning becomes uber complex. Mm-hmm. And then mm. you throw in the icing on the cake is the the BSS coloring where, you know, you're you're yeah. you're that's that may actually help, but will add complexity to say, well, I'm burning 40 megahertz. But this 40 megahertz is not actually going to contend with that 40 megahertz because <laughs> uh, on the same channels because they're on a different color. So you add yeah. all those components together and you may be able to bake a, a cake that comes out of the oven smelling mm-mm good but you're adding in flour and flour tastes terrible by itself and raw eggs can they taste terrible by themselves if you're going to bake this cake you're going to have a lot of horrible components that you got to put together just so and then you know before it comes out of the oven smelling mm-mm good so um yeah you I, forget it, that ax is also compatible on the 2.4 gigahertz yeah. Kill me now. Um, (laughs) You know, just, you know, uh, there are proprietary versions of 11AC on uh, 2.4 as well. Broadcom does that in their chipsets. It's they call it turbo qualm. Um, If you use that, you are you have a screw loose somewhere. Um, You're you're living on the edge there. Uh, I don't I don't uh, promote that at all. I think it's a terrible idea. And I think 11AX. Uh, the only time the 11AX is going to get any real efficiency in 2.4 gig is when all of the 11N and B and G and all that are gone. Now think about it for a second. How many B, G, and N clients are out there today um, on 2.4 gigahertz? Well, a gazillion, mm-hmm. right? It's mm-hmm. it's overwhelming. How long do you think it's going to take for those clients that are still being sold today uh, to work their way out of the spectrum so that... 11AX clients are the dominant uh, 2.4 gig transmitter so that you can have efficiency in 2.4 yeah. gig. It's, it's, I vote yeah. 20, 25 years. It's going to be there and, for a while, especially with IoT and, and different vendors wanting to use cheaper chipsets. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, this is 2000, middle of 2017, and 11, um, 11 Prime came out 20 years ago, right? Um, so we're using one and two megabits. And, and even still, in 1999, which is 18 years ago, uh, we, we were, um, you know, come out with 11B. Today, we still produce, there are vendors who still produce 11B chipsets. Mm-hmm. Um, because of range, sensitivity, power, uh, robustness of the HR DSSS, um, you know, um, uh, way of transmitting the modulation. Uh, it's, it, it's very low throughput, but it's very, very robust. And so that, that they're still being produced to, to, today. So you're talking about 18 years and they're still being manufactured, not, not even close to end of life. And so what do you, you know, how long do you think it's going to take before all that, all that stuff, BG and N, are out of the way of 11AX and 2.4? 25 years, minimum. And, and in that case, 11AX brings nothing to a 2.4 gig table. Nothing. I think, I think we have to remove the backwards compatibility to even get that started. Yeah, I think so. And, uh, but even still, you'll have, you know, probes and things like this that yeah. would cause disruption, yeah. right? They're looking yeah. for the network. You're going to have other issues, uh... You know the cellular guys. They, that's what they do, right? And they have other issues. Yeah, <laughs> they have to yeah. change. You have to change your your whole infrastructure if you want to be compatible with the new, uh, you know, standard. So, yeah, we didn't even uh, we didn't even you know d- discuss the fact that the cellular guys are now stealing our spectrum, and you know, they're, they're <laughs> bring that crap in on our on our five gig. It's not like we have enough channels as it is. I've got customers. You were mentioning San Fran just a, a minute ago. I've got uh, one customer in San Fran who rents office space. And he's got, you know, a thousand square feet or something like this for people just to come in and and use his Wi-Fi and use a little office for, you know, a meeting and and things like this. It's 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 a rent office. We rent it for a day or a week or a month mm-hmm. or a year. And and he said, you know, look, my Wi-Fi, I've got brand new Wi-Fi. Uh, and he, he was using, um, you know, a, a leading vendor. And he said, it's just terrible. And, and of course, we look at his spectrum and it's used up. Mm-hmm. In fact, he had 13 APs, um, you know, to try to get the capacity, but he, he only had four and all the channels were used. Every single channel, including 144 was used, um, across the spectrum, but at least we found four channels that had, uh, modest use. They were in use. There was mm-hmm. modest utilization. I said, you know, static, your, you know, take down uh, nine of your access points, leave four, turn, you know, turn the power up a little bit and uh, put them statically on those four channels and hope for the best because yeah. <laughs> neighbors have dynamic channels. And I said, by the way, um, in a year, when you call me and say it's no longer, it's been working for the last year, but now it's broken, I'm going to say, sorry, uh, wire, you know, offer your, your, uh, your customers. Yeah, wired wire. connection, yeah. Yeah, that's all you can do. <laughs> yeah, and you I know, I've, I've had discussions, with, I've had someone say, doesn't buying more or better wireless equipment help solve these issues? I've had someone ask me that question. (laughs) You know, it's, I like to tell people when they get into this field, the first thing you need to do is learn Wi-Fi fundamentals. You know, you need networking fundamentals first. You know, Mm -hmm. what is a hub? What is a switch? What is a a router? That kind of stuff. Routing and switching basics, you know, uh, OSI model, IP fundamentals, et cetera. Then get into the wireless fundamentals. That is your RF spectrum, ACI, CCI, uh, you know, the channel reuse, all of the, the fund, we know the fundamentals, antennas and so on, and learn the fundamentals. Then once you know networking fundamentals and Wi-Fi fundamentals, then it's time to learn your vendors, mm-hmm. you know, the vendors that you would be working with or supporting. And so if you're a VAR and you sell for vendor A, vendor B, vendor C, whoever, um, learn that vendor, of course. But then if you want to branch out to other vendors that you have to support, that's great. But do it in that order. So many folks are thrown into this field uh, by a VAR or yeah. what, what have you. And they, they start say, vendor first. They start vendor first. They don't learn any fundamentals. They don't even know networking. I've had Ekahau classes where some of my students were pulled out of the audio video job and put into doing surveying and <laughs> modeling. They didn't even understand what they were doing. <laughs> And they're like, when I said OSI model, they didn't understand it. Yeah. IP addressing, never heard of it. Um, you know, I just went, wow, what do we do here? So fundamentals are important. All right, Devin, thank you very much. I think we had a great discussion on the wider channels. We even went beyond and talked about, you know, AX and stuff like this. So that, that was great. Um, uh, Roel, do you have uh, uh, more questions for Devin before no, we close yeah. this one? I, I thought that was a great discussion. I learned a lot from this. I even learned a couple new things. Um, 
Uh, I mean, and that's great informa- information, Devin. And I agree a hundred percent on the training piece. I actually recommend that, that, um, structure as well, going from networking, then learn Wi-Fi fundamentals and then know your vendor. Cause if you don't know what the knobs do on your vendor equipment, that's not really going to help you out at all. <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, you know, if you learn the fundamentals, but you don't know how to apply those fundamentals to that vendor's configuration and deployment best practices, you're still just as just as hosed as you were before. <laughs> you, you really do need to know both quite well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not a really long process to become a good Wi-Fi engineer. It'll take you a couple of years of solid study. You know, networking fundamentals, Wi-Fi fundamentals, and then the vendor fundamentals, configuration, and deployment best practices. This is a couple of year process, but you know, the payout. Let's suppose you're, you know, doing, uh, I don't know, routing switching or uh, maybe Microsoft networking or, you know, systems integration or something. And you're making, you know, a decent living, you know, nothing wrong with what you're doing, but you want to get into something that maybe you consider more fun and something to make you a better living. Um, you got about a two year uh, learning curve. I think anybody, um, if I can do it, anybody can do it. I consider myself to be very average intelligence, but maybe with an above average work ethic, um, and, you know, I think anybody who's willing to study and to put in the hours uh, can do this is not an intelligence requirement. Um, and, you know, a couple of years. I, in fact, I've seen some some really smart folks do it much faster, a year of really hard study. And they just seem to have soaked it all up. So, you know, even a normal person in a couple of years can be a quite good a uh, Wi-Fi engineer. And uh, I believe it's a really good career field. It's a you can make very good money. Um, if you want to make really good money, you might have to travel some, mm-hmm. uh, as Keith Parsons, if you, you take a look at the WLPC, uh, Keith and, and his team did a kind of a salary survey and, and put some dynamics to it and, and explained how he put it all together. And you can see that, you know, a, a Wi-Fi engineer can make a pretty good living and having a big fun doing it. I mean, I love this stuff. I've been doing it for 20 years and I love it just as much today as when I got started. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's good tips there. Well, All right, Devin. So on, where, where, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Devin. Uh, where can people find you online? Yeah, so my website is um, it's divdyne.com, D-I-V, that's short for divergent, uh, Dyne, D-Y-N, short for dynamic. So divdyne.com, uh, they, uh, that's, it has my blog and my class schedule and, uh, and things like this. Um, and, of course, a lot of resources under my library, a lot of white papers and, and things like this that uh, I think are you know, very relevant and very helpful. Uh, also, uh, feel free to catch me on Twitter at, at Devin Aiken or even email me at uh, Devin at DivDine.com. Uh, any of those are perfectly fine with me. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. And I, I really recommend your blog. It's uh, it's really, really good. So we have some uh, sheets and design sheets and, um, you know, you, you give out some examples, some thresholds and stuff like this. So it's uh, I, I really like it personally. Well, thank you so much. Um, all right, guys. So thank you. Uh, thank you again for following us, uh, following the Clear to Send podcast, listening to us. Feel free to give us uh, you know, a review on iTunes and tell us how we're doing. Uh, you can share your ideas directly from the website, cleartosend.net. Uh, if you check on the top uh, right of the website, you can have a link to send us uh, a note uh, and so on. So feel free to do so. And I guess we'll, uh, we'll catch you back in, uh, in the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye.